Um, so I think Mel's up first, and then Darren's going to finish the presentation. Okay, thank you very much to the uh, New Zealand Landcare Trust for inviting me over and to Australian Landcare International who have now sent 10 Australians overseas to share the Landcare message and to bring Landcare experiences back to Australia. Uh, this is a co-presentation. I'm going to talk about the sort of institutional arrangements with catchment management authorities that are very similar to your regional uh, boards. And then Darren's going to talk more about the relationships, the important uh, relationships at the, the local level between catchment management authorities and land care groups. I just wanted to start uh, with a little bit of culture from across the ditch, partly entertainment, partly to leave you with a powerful message that I think you'll get. It's got a land care or catchment management theme to it. It's a poem that was written by C.J. Dennis, an Australian poet, back in 1915. And it's called The Old Master, and it goes like this. We were carting laths and palans from the slopes of Mount St. Leonard with our axles near the roadbed and the mud as stiff as glue. And our bullocks weren't precisely what you'd call conditioned nicely, and myself and messmate Mitchell had our doubts of getting through. See, she'd rained a tidy skyfall the week before we started, but our tucker bags depended on the selling of our load. So we punched them on by inches, lifted them across the pinches till we struck the final section and the worst part of the road. We were just congratulating one another on the going when we blundered in a pothole right within the side of goal where the bush track joins the metal, Mitchell, as he saw us settle, justified his reputation at the peril of his soul. We were in a glue pot, certain, red and stiff and most tenacious, over nave and over axle wagon, sitting on the road. Struth, I said, would never lift her, take a shot from hell to shift her, nothing left but to unyoke him and sling off the blessed load. Now, beside our spot of trouble stood a little one-roomed humpy, home to an enfeebled party by the name of Dan McGee. Daddy was, I paused to mention, living off an old age pension since he gave up bullock punching at the age of 83. Startled by our exclamation, Daddy hobbled from his shanty to where our stranded wagon looked like some half-founded ship. When the state of things he spotted, looks, he says, like you was potted. Then he toddled up to Mitchell and said, here, give me that whip. Now, I've heard of transformations, heard of the fellas sort of changing in the face of sudden danger or some great adversity, heard the like in rhyme and story and in bush traditions hoary, but I nearly dropped me bundle as I looked at Dan McGee. While I watched, he seemed to toughen as his finger gripped the handle, and his form grew straight but supple, and a glint came in his eye, and he walked around that wagon, not with footsteps weak and lagging, but with firm, determined bearing, as he flung the whip on high. Now he swung the leaders over while the whiplash snarled and volleyed, and they answered like one bullock, straining to every crack and clout. And he kept his cursing under till old Brindle made a blunder, and I thought all hell had hit me, and the master opened out, and the language, oh, the language, thought myself I must be dreaming, while these wondrous words and phrases only genius could produce, roared and rumbled faster and faster in the throat of the old master, oaths and curses tipped with lightning, crackling flames of fierce abuse. And we knew the man before us was a master of our calling, one of those great lords of language gone forever from out back, heroes of an ancient order, men who punched across the border, vanquished villains of the 60s, puncher princes of the track. Now we heard the timber strain and heard the wagons loud complaining. Then the master cried triumphant as he swung him into line, as they put their shoulder to it, lifted her and pulled her through it. That's the way we used to do it in the days of 69. At the foot of Mount St Leonard stands a little one-roomed humpy, home to an enfeebled party by the name of Dan McGee. If you seek him, folk will mention simply that he draws a pension, but to us he's the master, Prince of Punches, Dan McGee. <laughs> I could go on about the analogy, but I think the message is that in terms of catchment management, we've blundered in a pothole um, <clears throat> for no other reason that uh, decisions that were made in the past depended things like in the early line, uh, our tucker bags depended on the selling of our load and there were political decisions made about clearing the land, etc., that we're now restoring through land care. But the message is that we don't have to uh, sling off the blessed load. We've got... Uh, people with experience. Uh, we've got some 25 years of land care experience in Australia. We've got people like Doug Avery here in New Zealand who spoke this, this morning. And it's just really about collaboration and sharing that message so we can fast track our way to a sustainable future. I just want to give you a, a potted history of catchment management uh, in Australia. We started with things like the single issues program of the National Soil Conservation Program delivered by states and territories in the 1970s. We then moved to coordinated and integrated programs around salinity and water quality through the 80s. Landcare actually emerged uh, at Wingerlock in the region where I work now in 1986, November 86, and that's where Landcare started. 
Then in 1994, we had our first regional NRM organisations established. The catchment and land protection legislation was written and enacted at that time. And the first, land, the first regional catchment management authorities commenced their work on the 1st of July 1997. In 1989, through an alliance between the Australian Conservation Foundation and the National Farmers Federation, we started the Decade of Land Care and the National Land Care Program, which really saw strong support for regional and local level, level planning. Over the last decade, we've seen consolidation of that regional effort into things like the Natural Heritage Trust brought about by the sale of Telstra, a National Action Plan for Salinity Water Quality, and more recently and currently, you'll hear from Brett to hear later on about caring for our country. We now have 56 regional NRM or catchment management groups across Australia. In Victoria, where I come from, we have 10 catchment management authorities. Uh, my region is the north central in there, and the one that Darren comes from is the West Gippsland CMA region down there. Basically, the Great Divide crosses Victoria here. Uh, everything north of the Divide flows. The rivers and catchments all flow northward towards the Murray River and then off out to South Australia and down south of the divide, the, uh, the rivers all flow to the sea and Bass Strait. In my region, we occupy some 13% of Victoria, just to give you a feel for the size of our region and the complexity of the region. Our population is about 220,000, and that includes a large regional centre like Bendigo, which has about 100,000 people just in its, uh, its municipal boundary. We have four river catchments, the Loddon, the Campaspe, the Avon, Richardson and the Avoca. As I said, they all flow north towards the Murray River. We have about 7,500 kilometres of waterways and tributaries and uh, about 140 towns were built on those rivers. We have about 160 land care groups or land care light groups that exist in some eight networks that we support through the Catchment Management Authority. And all those groups say, face the same sorts of challenges that you people face in New Zealand. I had the opportunity on Monday with my partner to walk part of the Hakramata Range. I must commend the Department of Conservation for that magnificent walkway from the uh, water treatment plant up to the summit and then back down along the track to the scenic reserve where I became acquainted with all the familiar weeds that we have over there such as blackberry and uh, gorse and... Um, Patterson's Curse and others. But the challenge is the same. We have rabbits, we have foxes that you don't have. We have droughts. Uh, sometime in about 1997, the water was turned off and in 2010, it came back with a vengeance. We have some 160 groups in about eight networks across the region. And if you look at those circles, you'll see the majority of them are sort of located in the upper parts of the catchment towards the south. And, sorry, go back one. Okay, they're located in the upper parts of the catchment to the south, some through the middle in the dry land areas, and there are groups that exist in the irrigation areas, but they are not part of uh, existing networks at the moment. I just put this slide up to show you some of the issues that land care groups are dealing with. This is a particularly interesting one because it's in the upper part of the catchment. They get about four hours notice of a large rainfall event. This was 5th of September 2010 when the town flooded, uh, the creek flows through the town here and off out that way. Uh, a lot of people in the town attributed the above, bore, above floor flooding that they experienced in the centre of town to the work that the Landcare Group had done uh, early in the 2000s, late 1990s, where they planted up the creek. It was a particularly wet year. They planted twice as, twice as dense as they had expected to and had a fantastic strike rate. But the modelling that uh, subsequently took place when we were developing a flood plan indicated that it had nothing to do with that vegetation. It was just simply a uh, freak event and the creek could just not cope with that. The actual land care network that I'm involved with further north of this had planned a planting day for that very same day. We had people coming out of Melbourne on buses and we had four inches of water over every one of the sites that we planned on planting. And we had a celebratory dinner planned for that night. Well, damn it, we didn't have a good celebration even though we didn't plant a single tree that day. <laughs> we uh, replanted after that time and then we got those sites washed away in November and then January 2011 again. So Landcare is resilient and uh, we're continuing to, to replenish those sites uh, as we speak today. In the further south of the region, it's very, very flat as we head towards the Murray River. It's basically Loddon River floodplain and you can see some of the challenges where parts of our region, like a place called Benjeroot, was underwater for something like five months at a time. 
Very briefly, I'll touch on the structure of um, my particular catchment management authority because I think it's a good model that, as I say, has evolved since the, the 1980s and the 1990s and legislation that was passed in 1994 and through trial and error, we've come up with a process that consists of a board that, different to your regional boards, um, is actually a board that is appointed by the Minister for the Environment. And we also have a Natural Resource Management Committee, which is a community advisory committee to that board. And I want to talk a little bit about that in a moment. And then within the staff, some 70 staff, we have a series of teams. And one of those teams is the one that I manage, and that's called Communication and Community Program. So within that, we have a Regional Land Care Coordinator, a Regional Land Care Facilitator, which have very different jobs. Uh, one sort of focuses on the support for the groups. The other one focuses more on getting sustainable agricultural outcomes. Water Watch, I have, I've heard people talk about stream care, but Water Watch is a very significant program and a great catalyst for us in land care in our part of the region. Veronica Palmer, who you won't know, but she's my best uh, case study, she said by becoming a community water quality monitor, and we have 80 of these people across the region who take water samples regularly and feed that back to our Water Watch coordinator who puts them into a database. She said by becoming a Water Watch co uh, monitor, I actually gained the confidence and understanding of natural resource management issues that allowed me to get together with a few people and form a land care group to go about uh, improving the local landscape at a much uh, more vigorous scale. And then we also have an indigenous facilitator who uh, works closely with a, a range of different uh, mobs, as we call them, or indigenous groups across the region. I want to dwell on the Natural Resource Management Committee just very briefly. As I said in the previous slide, it's a community advisory committee to the board. They meet monthly and we support this committee very, very strongly. They're made up of farmers and land care group members, etc. We have two Indigenous representatives. This is Uncle Brian Nelson, who's a Jara, Jara, Jara elder. The Aboriginal people have been on the Australian continent for up to 60,000 years and uh, Brian's people have done a fantastic job as custodians of that land and he's shared his understanding of the landscape with us through that group. And on the right hand side is Ron Murray, who's a Wamba Wamba man and probably one of the top three didgeridoo players uh, in Australia, maybe in the world. He often starts our meetings with a didgeridoo playing to, uh, to welcome in the good spirit so that we have good and powerful meetings. And then there's some of the people you see who, who contribute that to that in the background. The thing about this particular community advisory group is that they actually make recommendations to the board about what projects or initiatives should be funded. And top of their list every year is Land Care and Water Watch. They understand that if you want to get um, effective catchment management throughout the whole of the organisation and throughout the whole of the North Central region, you've got to have the land care groups and the land care networks on site. In supporting land care, I'm not going to go into an enormous amount of detail. I just want to say that we do have a devolved grant scheme. Um, we're sort of quarantined in the vicinity of something like $320,000, $330,000 each year that we can distribute to the 160 groups across our region on a competitive basis. Uh, that helps to keep the works on the ground happening and keep the groups moving along. We have a ground cover newsletter, which you could all subscribe to if you wish to, that uh, keeps groups informed about what's happening at the CMA level and amongst the other groups. Just as you have Kiwi information nights, we have platypus information nights. They're great, great sources of information about platypus, which is a really good indicator of water quality, and they're starting to return into our streams. Uh, we assist farmers with sustainable practices. We have lots of school visits and a, a strong schools program. And most recently, we celebrated our 25th year of land care on the right-hand side. The photo there is a member of the board, uh, one of our corporate sponsors from a local bank, and two of our land care stalwarts, Tamsin and uh, Maury Diamond, who just do magic work on the ground supporting their local groups. The emerging issues for us include how to get young people into land care. We continue to work with that challenge. Volunteer burnout, as you do, work with that challenge. Uh, demand for knowledge, such as the incorporation of native grasses into farming systems, low input systems. Uh, group reporting, getting good quality data back from groups so that we can see whether we're actually making a difference and tell a better story about how land care is making a difference in our region and the funding cycle timing that uh, I could go on at length, but getting it right for the planning, the right planning time, uh, when the groups are going to get the best outcome on the ground is a critical issue for us. So my last slide is really one of a site um, where we've done an enormous amount of work. This is a 50 hectare site, which was bare salt affected land that we've revegetated 
and brought back to life. Uh, this is my daughter and, her, and my grandchildren. And a couple of the initiatives that uh, we actually carry out at this site, one of them is called an event called Last Child in the Woods. It's based on a book that was written by a North American researcher who found that uh, you know, urban children spending all their time on playstations, etc., were really missing out and that there is such a thing as what they call nature deficit disorder. And by getting them back out to reconnect with the landscape was a really important part of their health. And uh, we run that on an annual basis with that particular land care group. So I'll hand over to Darren, let him tell you the rest of the story and uh, I'm happy to take any more questions. I suppose my last comment would be happy to share any of this if any of you wanted to come to Australia and uh, be hosted and experience what we do in that part of the world. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mel. And um, if I've got Mr. Mr. Chairman, I reckon everyone's bums are about numb by now, so I'm going to, if we can, give you a, a disciplined 30 seconds to stand up and stretch the legs and get the brain functioning, if that's all right. It seemed like it was a well-earned one by the, the size that, that come from. Right, eh? We've still got a bit of time to get through, so to make sure I don't get in trouble for running late, I'm going to make sure your, um, your well-earned rest is very short-lived. So, um, Firstly, thanks to the New Zealand Land Care Trust for having us over here. It's a wonderful opportunity to, um, I suppose, and I've heard the word collaboration mentioned a few times this morning, and I think it really is the start of a great collaboration, hopefully, between Landcare in New Zealand and Landcare in Victoria, Landcare in Australia. So, um, The title of my slide is uh, titled exactly that, achieving, and I must have done something right in coming up with the title. It seems to have fitted very nicely with today's um, co uh, conversations that we, were, that we were going around. So my, the title of the slide is um, Achieving Catchment Management or Effective Catchment Management Through Collaborative Landcare Partnerships and ensuring in that that there's a, a reciprocal approach in the way that that's done in that relationship. Just in terms of um, my background in land care, um, I got involved at a very young age when our local land care group formed and, and they were going around the, the usual process of calling for people to fill positions and one of the older ladies said, there, said if we were going to form a land care group in our area, I want someone young to be involved in actually where it's heading. That's what land care is about. So um, I think I was about 17 at that, that age and got elected as the president of a local land care group. So, so you know, and I think that investment, when I look back at it, was, was really well earned, I think. You know, it's really helped me in, in terms of where I've grown in terms of land care. So I think it was a very important lesson in terms of what, what can be done if, if people are given opportunities. Um, so the context of the slide that I'm going to go through, or the presentation, is sort of in three parts. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the importance of collaboration and achieving a reciprocal relationships in, in those partnerships that are formed. I'll then talk on the important ingredients to effective catch-up management from my perspective, and some of those have actually been um, brought out this morning already, or today so far. And then I'll talk about the, the West Gippsland model and how things are done in, in our end of the world and how we actually make things work. So um, I actually went on the, the bus trip yesterday and it was a, a great experience to, to um, talk to a couple of, or be, be spoken to by a couple of locals um, and they showed us the projects that they were doing. And one thing that struck me with the first project we went to was the sign of what was being done there. And down, you know, there was a description of the works on one side, but on the other side was a whole lot of logos that um, displayed the, the level of partnerships that actually were going into making that successful. So, successful. So, to me, you know, land care is all about collaboration. And using the, the Victorian experience now, when people ask me to explain, or, you know, you're asked to explain how land care works, I pretty much use the image of a bowl of spaghetti because there's all these things that intertwine that you can't actually explain how it works because land care has just grown to a stage where those collaborations are happening all over the place and it just works effectively. So that's, that's my context on, on collaboration. It's great to hear that that come up as a real theme this morning. And I think it's important to, to really work on those things where there's mutual benefit and you work together to, to sort of progress those. Don't worry about where there's disagreement. You can, you can sort of work through those over times, but focus on what, you can, what you've got in mutual... Um, or what's of mutual interest and, and achieve that. And once you get those relationships going around something common, you'll find that the trust in the relationship and those, that sort of understanding between different organisations develops and grows over time. Um, a bit of work that we've done in, in land care in Victoria a few years ago was lo looking at those sort of um, those 
generally when you have collaborative sort of partnerships start, they're always around a short-term project when they initially form. So it's about getting something done on the ground and who can we get involved to do that. And that, that's great in that initial stage, but over time, it actually requires some long-term and sustained partnerships to be formed. And the bit of work we've done in Victoria realised that one of the key ingredients in, into those partnerships, or the long-term partnerships, was where you get a, a sense of respect, trust, and then the feeling of a, a sense of reciprocalness between t the two entities or, or a range of entities. So there's a, a, sort of an equal ground that you feel that you're placed on. And that sort of came out as very important to Landcare groups in Victoria and Landcare networks in Victoria, that there was that real understanding and a real respect about the relationship. And I suppose the image of the slide there, you know, natural resource management is all about people, all about relationships, and it's quite easy to burn, burn bridges if you're not careful. It takes a long term, long time in natural resource management to actually restore those if, if they're fragmented. So in terms of the important ingredients to uh, catchment management, I'll just touch on those, and these are really from my perspective. So one of the things I, I think is important, and it, it's come out a little bit today already, is about making planning relevant, and making planning relevant at all levels of, of the um, landscape and at the different organisational level. Um, and it's all, already been mentioned, but it's really, land care is all about, land care catchment management is all about people, and it's about people first. It's natural resource management activities come second to that. Um, Really important, I think, is leadership. Leadership in catchment management, leadership in land care, leadership in the community generally. So I'll, I'll explore, explore that a little bit more as well. Um, and leading into that is, is, is the engagement process that, that we use, the way we actually bring people into the, that partnership, into the collaboration. And, and there's some sort of pitfalls to that, I think, and some lessons to be learnt. Um, this one was touched on, it was, it was great to see the, you know, the, the opening session with the three farmers and really I think from my perspective growing up from a rural background having a farming connection is, is the valuing of localness, local knowledge, local wisdom. Um, even to our traditional, traditional knowledge it's there where it exists to value that local knowledge and experience and to make sure we tap into that and use it effectively. And most importantly I think one thing we need to really be considerate of is that long term legacy that we're leaving. Natural resource management is exactly that. It's about management, it's about long-term stuff. And if we're going to be effective long-term, we need to make sure that we have ownership of the work that's being done. So in terms of catchment planning, um, I think in many government organisations and businesses throughout the world, there's a whole lot of strategies and plans and studies and e reviews and evaluations that, that get done generally don't have a pointy end to them. They sit on a shelf somewhere, gather dust. They were good at the time, they're good for some background information, but if, they, if catchment planning is done where it doesn't have a pointy end, doesn't get to the ground, I think we're really failing in what we're, in what we're trying to set out to do. Very important in terms of background and context and bringing some scientific information and those sort of things to the surface, but most importantly, I think if we're going to plan in a catchment sense, in a community sense, it needs to be pointy, it needs to actually hit the ground at some stage. And land care is all about people. People come first and foremost in natural resource man management from my perspective. And again, it's all about developing a sense of trust, a sense of respect in a relationship. And it's the only effective way to have that long-term ownership. And, and what's really needed is to find out where there's mutual benefit. And even to, to some degree, is working out where, the, where there's self-interest from the community. What do they want out of natural resource management? What's their expectations? What's their desires? You've got to know what the community wants to start with. And you've got to be able to connect with people. So I'll just touch on, on leadership as well. I, to me, if I could um, think of one thing that's worked really well in, in Australia with the Landcare program, it's been its, its role in developing leaders. And, and leaders from the grassroots level that have worked their way up through the systems over, over years. 